Romans chapter 8 in your Bibles, if you would. We'll pick up where we left off last week, and I'm, I'm hoping to get to a certain point here tonight because I got something on my heart that I think will be a blessing and a help to you, and I hope it will, but we'll get there if we get there. So I don't want to, as I told you before, I don't want to rush it through Romans chapter 8 uh, at all. I want to pick up in verse number 7 if we can. The Bible says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Uh, thank you for being there. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving me, God. I, I just blows my mind that you'd save somebody like me. And then that you'd keep me saved. That you'd love me in spite of me. Oh, Lord, I, I, it, it, if anything is getting done and you're using me, it just blows my mind that you would use me. Uh, I realize, God, I'm not worthy, but Jesus Christ is. And I'm glad I have you. I'm glad I have him as my Savior, him in my heart. And I pray tonight you'd help us, Lord, as we're trying to serve you. Uh, give us the tools and the, the, the spiritual food and the wisdom and the discernment that we need uh, to figure out how to serve you better and, and the way you tell us to. We want to please you, Lord, and it's not really possible in and of ourselves. We, we fall short constantly, and yet you put in us all that we need uh, for life and godliness, and you've given us your word to instruct us. So please help us tonight, we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Um, I think Christians struggle a lot of times in their Christian life um, for a few different reasons. I was thinking about this and getting ready for this uh, teaching tonight, and I got thinking about it. I think a lot of times Christians struggle in their Christian life. I, when I say the, I mean victorious Christian life. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm talking about being happy as a Christian. I want to be a happy Christian, don't you? Uh, I get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, life is a struggle. The Christian life is a struggle. And I've been around Christians. I've been one of those Christians who's always complaining about how it's constantly a struggle. Always feeling like I'm not good enough and I failed again and woe is me and all the, what is it, Eeyore? Well, that cartoon? Is that the right one? The Eeyore Christian mentality, you know? Uh, I think the reason for that is, is probably various, but I got kind of trying to boil it down in my mind. And if I I'm honest and step back and take a look at the situation. I think a lot of times the reason for that defeatist mentality among saved people is probably some miscommunication. Yet in the King James Bible believe in church. I'm talking about our stripe now. I'm not shooting at all the other churches. I really don't know their business good enough. But I'm talking about people that love the Bible, believe the Bible, and preach the Bible. I think a lot of times Bible-believing Christians get the defeatist mentality because of miscommunication. So let me give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. You're all a bunch of sinners. And that's how you, I knew you were going to respond that way. I just set you up and you stepped right into it. That you shook your heads yes and you said amen. That's right. And it's just like this little rumbling across the room. It wasn't even on one side. It went all the way to the back. And on both sides of the room, I either got head shaking yes or yep, yeah, amen or yes, sir, amen. Like, so that's the truth, right? And we've learned to love the truth, don't we? I mean, even if the truth tells us we're wrong. And so we accept that truth. I'm a sinner. And in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Yes, amen, that's right. And if God does do anything with us, in us, and through us, it ain't our glory, it's His glory. Right? And so we understand all these doctrines and these, these concepts, spiritually speaking, and we agree to all of them. And so it kind of can easily become this, since we're hard preaching, straight preaching in a world that won't preach against sin, churches that pastors won't get up and tell you the truth about your flesh, we can become so focused on those truths that it literally drags us down into the wrong mindset. So I preach hard against sin, and I'm not going to stop by the grace of God. Actually, I've been listening to some old school preachers, and I want to get more like that. I really like some of those old school guys that got in the pulpit back when men were men and women were women, and everybody was way more mature, and there wasn't as much humanism in the world, and nobody was worshiping the animals yet, and all the rest of that stuff just wasn't going on. Do you understand what I'm saying? And they get up there and just let it rip, tater chip, and everybody be shouting amen. And I want to be like that. I'm not planning on softening the truth at all. But I think the devil gets advantage of us sometimes with a miscommunication. So yes, you are a sinner. Yeah, in you that is in your flesh dwelleth no good thing. But that doesn't mean God can't help you. That doesn't mean God can't give you victory over sin. That doesn't mean you can't learn how to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean you can't perfect holiness in the fear of God. 
And so it's a miscommunication. I think it's a misunderstanding sometimes. I think the preacher says things from the pulpit when he's preaching and teaching the Bible, and somewhere between his mouth and the hearer's ears or whatever it might be, differences in background and education and uh, upbringing or whatever it is, there's a misunderstanding of what's being said, so we get the defeatist mentality. I think a lot of times there's a misrepresentation. In other words, what does it mean to be holy and to live the Christian life? I've seen religious leaders send a message to people as though somehow or another they have arrived at this level that nobody else can arrive to. That their prayer life is so above and beyond what you could ever attain to because they're so godly and so spiritual and so holy that literally, you know, when I go fishing, I wear a suit, a three-piece suit in case I have an opportunity to witness. And when I gut a deer, I wear my best suit because you never know when somebody's going to pull in the driveway or the Mormons are going to come up or the Amazon driver. Every person I cross every day of my life, I'm always handing out gospel tracts because I'm always ready to witness and I'm always living in victory. And I I think that kind of a misrepresentation discourages real people, like normal people, like people that wake up with a headache in a bad mood, people that, you know, kind of like make mistakes in life and aren't always living in this. God is good all the time. Like, you can't, you know, the one uppers, when you say God is good, they have to come back with all the time. You know, it's like, okay, you're more godly than me. I'm sorry. I forgot about the all the time thing, <laughs> you know. I think the misrepresentation of reality actually causes Christians to become defeatists in their spirit. I don't think God gave us the Bible that way. I think you and I need to realize that we can live the victorious Christian life, but as we're going through Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is kind of dividing some things out and kind of spelling some things out and drawing our attention to the distinctions so that we can understand sort of the mechanics of what's happening as a Christian, as a human being, as a sinful person with the Holy Spirit within you, trying to do something in and through your life to develop you spiritually. And when you can understand the mechanics of that, I feel like that helps. I mean, if you, uh, like we were talking the other day, you don't send guys out on a job without telling them what job they're going to do, what the dimensions are, what they need, and then you make sure you give them all the tools that they need when they head out to the job to go get that job done. And that is the job of the church. It's not just to give you some pretty speech or just to constantly beat you down and always remind you how wicked you are and how, well, even when God does something in your life or with your life or through your life, it's like, well, it wasn't you, it was God. Let me show you a way that we do this. Before we compliment somebody, we say, no, I'm not trying to give you the big head. Just keep it. No problem. Because now if I say thank you, I appreciate that, that's encouraging, you're going to think, wow, he's awful proud. Just compliment somebody. It's your job to edify them. It's their job to keep their head down and be humble, right? So we got to, like, get some tools to kind of figure out how to live the victorious Christian life because that's what God gave you the book for. That's what church is supposed to be for, the edifying, the building up of the saints. In verse number seven, you got to understand something about your mind. We ran a bunch of references at the end of the last time about our minds. You got to understand something about your mind that will help you in submitting to the Spirit of God and following Jesus Christ. The carnal mind is enmity against God. That means the opposite of friendship. The quality of being an enemy, it's ill will and hatred, that's the carnal mind. In other words, as a saved man, I still have a human mind. And my human mind does not like, appreciate, go in tune with, or follow Almighty God's mind. It tells Abraham, get thee from thy country, from thy kindred, on the land that I shall tell thee. Excuse me? Yeah, my will for you is to get away from your family, away from your country, and just get going. Where am I going? Don't worry about it. Just get going. But how's this going to turn out? Don't worry about it. Just get going. Abraham had such a difficult time with that that he disobeyed it. He said, from your kindred, and he took family with him and messed up as a result. The Ammonites and Moabites may have never existed if he didn't mess up and take a lot with him. You remember that story, don't you, and how that worked out. And where the Ammonites and Moabites came from, don't you? 
Lots and his daughters and all that mess after Sodom and Gomorrah, that was a direct result of Abraham's disobedience because the human mind doesn't understand and is not in tune with the mind of God. I will guarantee you that. You live long enough, you'll figure out God in his perfect will will allow some things in your life you'd have never asked for. And you'd look at him and say, how could Romans 8.28 ever work out? We'll get there in a little bit, not tonight. But your carnal mind goes directly against God's mind. And you got to understand that. If you can understand that, it'll help you live the victorious Christian life. Because the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. You realize this humanistic Christianity will never work. This Christianity of, you know, well, we're all children of the king, and we're all perfect, and we're all this, and we're all that, we're all wonderful, and human nature is essentially good, and we're bringing in the kingdom, and all the rest of that stuff. Listen, that humanistic Christianity will never work, because your carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So there's nothing about Mike Reagan's mind that can be subject to God. I need a new mind, which is the mind of Christ. That's what I love about my Bible. That's why I try to start out every day of my life, I, I try as faithfully as humanly possible to start out every day of my life in this book. Now, it's just been in the last year or so that I have to kind of give myself about 15 minutes to actually get the smog out of my head. I don't know, this never used to happen to me. Don't, please don't tell me it's because I'm eating ice cream before bed or I'm eating dinner too late. I don't do any of that stuff, okay? Please don't tell me it's I'm dehydrated. The first thing I do is hit water. I make sure I drink enough water. I don't know what it is. It's just a new phenomenon that's happened in my life. If I actually get my Bible out, I can't even see that it's all blurry for about 15 minutes. Glasses or no? So I have to give it a little bit to kind of warm things up. You understand what I'm saying? But I try to make it a high priority as one of the first things I do when I can center my attention on something to get it in the words of God because this thing will give you the mind of Christ. And as a Christian, if you're going to get victory in your life, if you're going to grow in Jesus Christ, if you're going to change like we all want to or you wouldn't be here tonight, you got to get the mind of Christ. Look at verse 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Does that mean a Christian can't please God? No, it doesn't. You know why? Because you're not in the flesh anymore. Verse number 8 is a lost person. Look at verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. See it? So verse 8 is a lost person. Verse 9 is a saved person. Ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of Christ dwelleth in you. Dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So you are not saved if you don't have the spirit of Christ in you. It's called being born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hearest the sound thereof. Canst not tell whence it cometh, nor whether it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Have you been born again? If you've been born again, then you have the Spirit of Christ in you. That means you're His. And guess what? That means according to God when He looks at you. You see, you can't look at the outside and tell. When you study the Bible and you begin to understand what the circumcision made without hands is and all the rest of that stuff, you can sort of like, oh, that makes sense. I get that. And you can kind of, excuse me for this, but you can kind of feel it. It's like a, a different level of conviction you didn't have before. It's like there's just something has changed about me. I don't enjoy sin anymore. I, I don't want to do what I used to do, and yet I do what I don't want to do, and what I don't want to do, I do, do and do want to do, don't do, and blah, blah, blah. You know, like Paul was saying, you got that quandary going on, and when somebody shows you from the Bible what happened to you, you, you got saved, you're like, wow, light bulbs. Now everything makes more sense. But I can't look at you and tell whether or not your flesh you're, is, is circumcised spiritually inside of you away from your soul. I can't tell it by looking at you. So a lost man is still in the flesh. That's why I've told you when they touch something unclean, it defiles all of them, their body, soul, and spirit. You can touch something unclean, defile your body, even to the point of death without defiling your soul because you're not in the flesh. Ain't that wild? But you're in the flesh still. <laughs> Isn't that fun? So figure that out. I can't figure that out any more than I can figure out how I'm alive. I don't have the power to keep myself alive. I lay down every night, and it's a type of death. I lay down every night, and I just trust God that I'm going to wake up in the morning. I wake up in the morning, and I'm still breathing. I didn't do that for myself. I can't figure that stuff out. 
It's, mir it's miraculous. What God did with you when he saved you is miraculous. It's a wonderful thing. You're living in this defeatist mentality because you're still stuck in the flesh and all you can see is what you do wrong. But listen, you've got to understand, you're not in the flesh but in the spirit, so you can please God. Look at verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. You know whose righteousness that is? It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ inside of you. And if Christ be in you, your body is dead because of sin. You're still going to die. But your spirit, it's life. You've already, if you're born again, you've already entered eternal life. I am literally 40 years into eternity right now. I'm getting older. I'm eventually going to die. Who knows sooner or later? I don't know. God only knows. But it really doesn't matter because that's not me anymore. What you're looking at is a shell that I'm inhabiting. Sure. You do realize your body matters, right? Yes, How does it matter to you if you're just dying? What difference does your body really make? Well, we know a couple things. We know the Bible says that your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. So my body matters because it's the temple in which the Holy Spirit is dwelling. And it's the vehicle through which I serve him while I'm in this life. So therefore, what I do in my body does matter. I can give my body to sin or I can give my body to following Jesus Christ and glorifying him. I really want my life to amount to something. That, that's, that's a decision that I'm making daily. And today, I'm standing here before you right now and I want, from the bottom of my heart, I want my life to amount to something. That doesn't mean what all these lost people mean. Some kind of a legacy I want to leave behind. What a great man he was. World champion UFC fighter. Or world champion jujitsu guy. World champion powerlifter or bodybuilder. World champion. What a, none of that stuff. None of that stuff. That's not a legacy. That, that's, that's foolishness that amounts to absolutely nothing but your own pride and ego. I want my life literally to amount to something. I'm not talking about becoming the CEO of a great big corporation and, and having the, all the money in the world and all the fancy cars in the world. What, what good does that really do? None. I'm talking about a life that amounts to something. So guess what I've got? I'm stuck inside here right now. As frustrating as that absolutely is. But this is a vehicle through which I'm to serve the Lord. So you know what you're told? You're not to defile that body. Why? Because your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why it says bodily exercise profiteth little. I don't know why all the preachers, not all the preachers, a lot of preachers, get to that passage like bodily exercise profiteth little. And they're, they're preaching it as though that means you shouldn't exercise. And you can tell by looking at them. <laughs> That's not what it says. It says it profits little. There is some profit to it. You know what you got to do? You got to keep it in check because it's not going to amount to much. It helps you serve the Lord a little bit more. Maybe if you're smart, you know, I, I believe this is just whatever. You can take this or leave it. You know, I'm not going to argue with anybody about it or beat my chest that I'm right and everybody else is wrong. But I believe that God has your days appointed. I also believe you can change God's plans. I also believe God can change his own plans. Was that Hezekiah? Rolled over, faced the wall, and prayed. And God said, All right, I'll add 15 years. God punched his ticket already. But he sought the Lord, and the Lord said, Okay, I'll, I'll change my mind. You know, God's not implacable. Romans chapter 1. God's not unmerciful. When the Bible says God repented, it doesn't mean God got right because he was wrong, it means God changed his mind. But I do believe he's got your days already appointed. You know what I don't want to do? I don't want to cut them short because cause I'm sneaking out back to smoke a cigarette. I don't want to cut them short because I can't control myself. I just got to have that donut at 1130 at night. I don't want to cut them short because I can't control myself. I just got to smoke that dope, drink that whiskey, live like the devil. You understand what I'm saying? I believe you get drunk, get in the car and start driving down the road, you might die. And God hadn't planned for you to go yet. 
just talking about your body. You got to understand that that body is it's important because it's how you serve God in the flesh. It's how you serve God in this world. If Christ be in you, it's dead because of sin. Why? Because in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. But your spirit is not dead. Your spirit of Christ is in you is made righteous. You are literally as good as in heaven. When John got caught up into the third heaven, out into the future, and saw you standing there, I, blow your mind just a little bit. I can't necessarily profess to figure this out. I literally think I'm already there. While I'm standing here right now. Because you're in time, he's in eternity. You can't figure eternity out. There's no time in eternity. He was, he is, and he is to come. That's wild, isn't it? Verse 11, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So if the spirit of Jesus Christ who came up from the dead is in you, then if he raised up Christ from the dead, you know what he's going to do? He's going to quicken your mortal body. And you're going to have a glorified body. That dead body, you can write, jot, jot these notes down if you will because I'm, I'm making good time and I don't want to lose my time because I want to run a bunch of references with you in just a couple of minutes. really want to get to a specific point tonight. But jot these references down if you would. You can look at 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 58. What you're going to see when you look at that, I'll repeat it here again in a minute. What you're going to see when you go read that is you're going to see this. He tells you, if a seed's going to produce fruit, that seed has to go into the ground and die in order for that fruit to come up out of the ground. Now, here's what's really cool when you read that later. Check this out. He says it might chance of wheat or this or that. When you're looking at the seed, you don't necessarily know exactly what it is. You put it in the ground, you wait for it to come out, and then you see what it was. I think, I think, when you save people that are doing the best you can to serve God one day at a time, and you feel like it's not much, you never were a preacher, you never were a missionary, whatever, I think you're not even going to know until you die, and then you rise again, exactly what God was doing in this life with that body you were living in. I think it's like Christmas. I think it's like, surprise, and it's going to literally blow your mind what he was doing in this little life you were living. Because he said, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. So we don't know what it's going to be, but we do know this, that body has to go into the ground in order for God to bring out of it something glorified, something beautiful, some real fruit that lasts forever. So yeah, we see some fruit in this life, but nothing like what you're going to see on the other side based on what you're trying, the best you can, trying to do for God now. That's pretty awesome. Right now, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 58. Right now, it's Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 9. <coughs> Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 9. I'm almost positive that's the one that tells you that you're seated with him already. I'll read it to you real quick. I, I want you to see, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's past tense. That's wild. He says, you were dead in sins, you're quickened by Christ, and what has he done by grace you're saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. Well, since Jesus Christ is seated there, he says, if the Spirit of Christ is in you, and that means you're in him, and you're as good as sitting there already, he's already raised you up. So all he's waiting for is either you to die when he's done and he's got your days determined and you go into that grave, he's waiting for that, he'll pull you right up, no problem at all. And when that rapture hits, that body comes up out of that grave, you get a glorified body, rejoins that soul and spirit, and there you go off into eternity with a, with a, with a glorified body.
perfectly like Jesus Christ, no sin in it at all. What a great thing, man. All right, there's another one. Write down Colossians 2, verses 11 through 15, and you can read that later. That's the circumcision made without hands and the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the operation of God. It's salvation. It's a circumcision made without hands. It's putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. It's an internal circumcision that's a spiritual thing that God does the moment you're saved. So when we focus on woe is me and I'm always a failure and none of us are righteous, no, not one. You got to stay humble, brother. You got to stay humble, brother. What we're doing is we're focusing on the flesh all the time. We're always talking about how we fail. We're talking about how we sin all the time. It's this constant infatuation with the flesh. And really, I think that drags Christians down in discouragement because that body is dying, which is God's mark, God's stamp, God's tattoo on you. Oh, I shouldn't use that illustration. To say, look, you are definitely a sinner. I look at some of those old saints of God, man, been listening to some of them preach this week. Listen to one by R.G. Lee, you listen to one by Lester Roloff, and man, Maze Jackson. No, the older they get, the more they just seem to have something. I can't explain it. I don't see it in the modern day generations. I mean, I do see some alive today, excuse me for saying that. I, there's some old preachers around now, that, but the vast majority of them don't have it. The other ones are real gems, boy. I want to be one of those guys. You know what's wild to me thinking about that this week and studying this? They, they really didn't, they, they had more to them as they got older. And they were getting weaker. And they were dying. I was actually running through looking at some of the, 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 the uh, times when they died. Some of the great preachers, man, I didn't know that they died at 58, 52, 68, 62. Great preachers. Preachers, historical preachers, everybody thinks they're, I didn't realize they were dying that young. I, I wonder, it's just me thinking out loud, okay? I wonder, it's, it's because God says, okay, you've got everything done, I want you to get done. Let's put that in the ground and come on up. I mean, to us, as a carnal mind, when the Lord walks through his flower garden and plucks a flower too early, to us in our carnal mind, it's enmity against God. I'm not a friend of you taking somebody I love too early. That's the carnal mind. But I wonder in God's mind if he comes through and plucks him early because he says that one's ready. That one's beautiful. That one's done. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I'm not God. I'm just saying his ways aren't my ways. His thoughts aren't my thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than my ways and his thoughts than my thoughts. I do know this. I do know we all have an appointment with this sinful body. It's going to die. That's why I'm, I really do hope for a rapture. I would really like to, to go up with my family, with you. I really would. I think that'd be just A-OK, -okay, man. Wouldn't it be great to be the generation that the Lord's going to call out of here? I mean, come on, man. So much better than the way of mankind everywhere that none of us are going to eventually escape. But death for a Christian ain't that bad of a thing. Because all it is is it's sowing it's this physical body into the ground so that finally you can, you can get released from the bondage you're stuck in when you're living in a sinful body. All right, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. You don't owe your flesh nothing. You fellows, you're on your way home from work, especially in the hot summer days, and those filthy, God-forsaken alcohol companies got their signs up on the highway, and it's a spring day in Michigan, and the windows are down, and the devil flashes you back, and you think, ah, cold beer sounds real good. You ain't a debtor to that. You, you should tell that flesh, no, that ain't the mind of Christ. I owe you nothing. You know what the flesh says? You owe me. It's been a long time. You know what your response ought to be? I owe you nothing. 
you get tempted, whatever that temptation may be. You just list it. You all know you're all big boys and girls. You can figure it out. Whatever that temptation is, you know what you ought to tell your flesh? I owe you nothing. Verse 13. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. That's what it's doing. Do you know your flesh is such a cruel master? It will get you to shoot up until you overdose. Did you know that? Your flesh is such a cruel master, it'll get you to light that cigarette up and keep lighting that thing up until you die. Your flesh is such a cruel master, it'll get you drowning other alcohol and keep you taking that alcohol into it because your flesh loves that alcohol no matter what it's doing to your liver, to your kidneys, to your heart, to whatever else, no matter what it's doing to your family, to your own mental health, to your job, to your finances, it will keep you dying because your flesh loves sin. Now, while... What in a saved person gets us to follow after our flesh? I'm not trying to turn you all into like, you know, you can get so ultra disciplined that you no longer enjoy your life. Do you understand what I'm saying? So like, look, you know, once in a while, you know, get an ice cream. You, you won't die. Amen. Amen? Once in a while, have a cookie. At Christmas time, you know, we made a deal. We're not going to count calories. We're not going to worry about nothing. We're going to eat whatever we want over Christmas, and it was a blast. I don't repent. I think the whole family had more fun because everybody else wasn't feeling guilty when I was, like, watching them as they were eating cookies that I wouldn't let myself eat because I'm jealous. I don't think you should go crazy. I do say this. I do think you need a lot of people need more discipline and sometimes you just got to tell your flesh get up sometimes you got to tell your flesh no because your flesh does not know what's best for you it will kill you you should know better you should have the mind of Christ to control that flesh and don't you ever trust it but if you through the spirit now here's here's one of those one of those tools that I said I think Christians need Saved Bible believers need the tools to figure it out. Because none of you had a problem with me saying anything about alcohol that I know of. None of you had a problem with me saying anything about cigarettes. None of you had a problem with me saying anything about drugs. I don't think any of you have ever gotten mad at me preaching about fornication or adultery or any of the rest of that stuff. I don't think any of you have ever said, I can't believe he'd say that. I'd be willing to bet you that even if some of you are cussers when you shouldn't be, and I preached against cussing recently, I don't think you had a problem with me. I think you're such Bible believers and such genuine Christians, really genuinely wanting God, that you say, yeah, you're right, I should stop cussing. And you put your head down and feel embarrassed about it. I really don't think your problem is that you have an issue with anything that's been said so far. I think sometimes we have a problem with understanding how to put it into practice. Look at verse 13. How do you mortify the deeds of the body? You don't do it through discipline. There's a limit to your human discipline. I already said some people need more discipline. That is a great place to start, okay? <laughs> just like, you know, I'm going to just get the I ain't gonna mentality. Or I am gonna mentality. I think a lot of Christians nowadays need a little more, I mean, I don't know what, you know, what it means or whatever, old school saying, more grit in their crawl. Right? Just need to leave, be a little more gutsy. But you got to understand that you can't do this thing in the power of the flesh. You can't get so self-disciplined that you get victory over something that Paul said, I can't do it. Look, if Paul can't do it, you and I can't do it either. But there's a methodology to getting victory. It's through the spirit you mortify, that is kill the deeds of the flesh. It takes the spirit of God to change you. And you got to recognize that he's always working to try to help you. Now watch this. Verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. All right, now here's how the people that believe you can lose your salvation will interpret this verse. 
If somebody's not being led by the Spirit of God, they're no longer the Son of God. They'll say you can lose your salvation. Or they'll say, well, they must have never been saved in the first place. Here's the phrase I heard a million times. She heard it in college too. They were professors, but not possessors. They professed Christ, but they never knew Him. Okay. So you're going to tell me that you can look at somebody's life and you can determine whether or not they actually are born again by the way they're living. This is a verse that they'll use to prove it. In order to do that, in order to prove that from this verse, I have to pull this verse out of context. I have to ignore dozens of other verses that I've already showed you that prove to us that a saved person can do wrong. That's why Paul says to mortify the deeds of the body, to put off the things of the flesh. He's telling you, listen, if you don't, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep, God will judge you. The Bible shows us clearly that saved people are already saved, eternally secured, in as good as in heaven, have the ability to live like a saved person or live like a lost person. A saved person can get so backslidden on God, so ignorant to and resistant against and quenching and grieving and putting out the Spirit of God and emptied of that filling while you're sealed with Him where He won't leave you, but you cannot be filled with Him and go so far as to become reprobate. Saved. That's a scary thought. So if you want to ignore all those other verses, then you can believe that verse 14 is saying they either never did get saved or they lost their salvation. But if you look over at verse number 29, which we'll get to soon, so we're not going to dwell on it long, but it says this, for whom he did foreknow, then he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, I'll, I'll get into this in detail when we get to it. But I want you to understand this. The day you got saved, you were predestinated to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Sooner or later, if you're saved, and definitely later after you die, you will be like Jesus Christ, period, the end, for all of eternity. You know what you're doing right now? You're practicing. You're getting a chance to show God you love Him and you want to be like Him. You're getting a chance to lay up some treasures in heaven. You're getting a chance to earn an opportunity that I'll show you in just a little bit in the millennial reign. That's what you're doing now. But if you refuse to do so now, when you die, he'll conform you to Jesus Christ's image. You're predestinated to it. So in verse number 14, you're led by the Spirit of God as a saved person, whether you want to be or not, once you die. He's taking you to heaven. Verse 15, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You know, that's a very tender verse. You know what that thing is leading up to? Leading up to that verse? It's all about your mortal bodies. It's all about your mind being messed up because you've got a carnal mind that don't appreciate what God wants to do. All the way leading up to that verse. You guys realize that when I say you should keep short accounts with God, it's not because you're receiving the spirit of fear. It's because the spirit of God in you convicts you of your wrongdoing. And you know when you're backslidden. You know when you're not serving God. You know when you're doing things a Christian shouldn't do. And, and his spirit is tender to you, saying, listen, would you get it right? Would you come home? It's a spirit of adoption. Like, like a father that really doesn't even owe us anything, but picked us. Look, once you have a child, you give birth to a child, mama. You brought that kid into the world, daddy. Once you have a child, you are obligated to those kids. You have a duty. Whether they know it, appreciate it, realize it or not, it has nothing to do with anything. You have a duty. That's why Christian men ought to pay their child support. Whether they're being forced to or not. It's the right thing to do. And take their turn on the weekend. It's the right thing to do. Why? You have a duty. You know, what, you know what he did? You know what God did? He walked along to somebody he didn't even have a duty to and said, I'll adopt him. I'll take him. It's my responsibility. Come on. 
I realize it's tough for people adopted. I, I met a young man this week, 22 years old. He just started telling me about his life a little bit. I've known him for, I, sh I said I met him, I talked to him. Known him for a little while. He's a friend of Lucas's who visited here. And he's kind of opened up to me a little bit this week. And boy, he is adopted and he got a tough story. I get it, it's tough. But man, you know how special that love is? That's a special kind of love. When a parent would say, you might not be mine, but I'm going to take you and treat you like you are and try to raise you like you are. You ought to be grateful for that. That ought to mean something to you. So God did for you. So you ought to be able to go to him and say, Father, I messed up again. Would you help me? Would you please help me? Folks, that's the spirit of a Christian recognizing I'm a sinner, I'm no good, I mess up. I'm a, it's, not, it's not the spirit of, you know, this false humility. It's nauseating. It's a spirit of I might be no good and I might keep messing up, but he loves me and I love him back for it. And I ask him to forgive me because I want to be close to him and I want him to do something with my life. Perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. I think we ought to love the Lord a little bit more. You got, you got no good reason not to love him. Not one of you in this room has a good reason not to love the Lord. Not one of you. And I think loving him will help us get to him. The Spirit itself, verse 16, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So when kids get saved when they're real young and then they get a little bit older and they say, I'm not sure, don't you ever discourage them. Let them make it sure. Especially when they get saved super young. They'll get to a point where they might not have a, anything inside them bearing witness. And if there's nothing inside them bearing witness, then make sure you let them get something inside them bearing witness. But if you are saved, something inside of you lets you know it. You know, you can get so backslidden you're not sure anymore. Verse 17, if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Now watch it. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You know what's interesting? You're a child, right? Once you get saved. If you're a child, then an heir. There's a condition to your airing. The condition is not on your childhood. It's the difference between your fellowship with the Lord and your, and your sonship. You're a son once you get saved, but your fellowship is conditional. Does that make sense? Your sonship is not conditional. Once you're saved, you're his child, period, the end. Your fellowship is conditional. And as a son, you can be a son without becoming an heir. Okay? To the inheritance. You're an heir of eternal life through Jesus Christ. But we're talking about something else. He says, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So wait a minute. My inheritance when I get to heaven is based on my suffering in the here and now. Jesus said, take up thy you know he said it over and over and over again in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? And follow me. Now watch verse 18. This is the last verse we're going to look at, but I want to run through some references with you real quick, and I got them set in order so we can do it fast. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You suffered at all? Now listen, all of you should have said yes. You, you know what good Christian people do? Good Christian people downplay their suffering because they know somebody that's got it worse than them. I know people that have it worse than me. And honestly, I see that and it does humble me. You know why it humbles me? Because I struggle enough with my little problems. I see Christians with bigger problems trying to stay faithful to God and do right. And it humbles me. But it doesn't take away the fact that I have my own sufferings. If you're saved and you're trying to do right, you've already suffered. How many of you have been made fun of in 2023 for being a Christian some way, shape, or form? Come on, don't be shy. Like made fun of, like somebody's made a comment, took a shot at you. That's suffering. How many of you got comments from people and harped on for coming to this church? 
<laughs> wow, more than I thought. That's a blessing. You know what that is? That's suffering. If you came here for the right reason. So that's, that's the condition of getting an inheritance. He said, I reckon the suffering of this present time. He said, I reckon the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. So if you suffer this much, he's going to exponentially bless that suffering. So when you see somebody really suffering, I'm talking heavy duty suffering. But they try, they try the best they can to stay faithful to God in that heavy duty suffering. I didn't say they're perfect. I didn't say they don't doubt. I didn't say their faith doesn't wobble. You ain't human if it doesn't. You don't even have a human mind. You're not even in human flesh if you don't struggle. Yeah. See, it's the devil that tells you that struggle and makes you unfaithful. It ain't, the, it ain't all the Father telling you that. He said, if you're suffering, I am going to take that suffering, if you walk with me through it, and I'm going to multiply that thing so much I don't even have a way to explain it to you because you're human. Ain't that a trip? Can we want some references real quick on suffering? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to keep moving to our right through our Bible. And i got a few to look at and then we'll be done for tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse 17. Uh, look at verse 16. For that for which cause we faint not. Don't quit. But though our outward man perish. <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You got to focus on the spirit, not the flesh. For our light affliction. Well, this is a guy that got in prison and shipwrecked and health problems and murdered and the whole nine yards. And he said our light affliction which is but for a moment. Think about it. My last answer, no man stood with me. Do you, you know loneliness is an affliction? You know all the way through the Bible you find people that were lonely? You singles need to listen up to that. I've watched the devil use that loneliness to get singles out of church. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, that's what God's doing with your suffering. He's watching you suffer while you're here and he's piling it up for you on the other side because you're still trying. Never said you're perfect. I said you're still trying. And you're failing, but you're getting back up. Go to Philippians, please. Philippians chapter 3. Keep going to your right. Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse 10. Hebrews 3.10. He says that I may know him. You want to get to know the Lord better? And the power of his resurrection. I like that part. It sounds good, don't it? Here's how to do it. And the fellowship of his sufferings. <laughs> oh. Being made conformable unto his death. Your suffering is supposed to give you some rewards in heaven. It's supposed to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. If he suffered, you and I are going to. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 12. 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus. Trying to do right? The kids want to do right in school? shall suffer persecution. You mean as a junior higher, elementary, high school kid, I can lay up treasures in heaven and have a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory coming to me if I get made fun of in school and I'm willing to do that for the Lord? Go to the book of Hebrews, please. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Look at verse 9. I'll, we'll stop here. I got a bunch more. and I, I'm not going to get through them. I, I'll take too long. But we see Jesus, 
who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Wait a minute. Hold on. We see Jesus. He's made a little lower than the angels. What was the purpose? The suffering of death. He's crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. God hath highly exalted him, given him a name that's above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. That he, by the grace of God, it was the grace of God allowing him to taste death for every man. For it became him, watch this, for whom are all things, God's doing it all for Jesus Christ. And by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. That doesn't mean Jesus was sin, sin, sinful to make him perfect. That's a perfecting process till he was ready and God had him where God wanted him to be. It doesn't mean he went from sinful to holiness. See, we define these words wrong. God made him perfect. How? The perfect sacrifice. Through suffering. You know why God allows you to suffer? You know why it's a kind of a blessing that God leaves us people with the Spirit of God in us and we're, we're trapped in struggling flesh that is tempted to do wrong all the time? That right there gives you an opportunity to suffer for Jesus Christ. Some of you are struggling with some stuff. And you feel guilty because you're struggling with stuff. And you're like, I should have been over this a long time ago and I'm still struggling after all these years. You're suffering. You're suffering. Because you're still trying. And that's pleasing to God. If he allowed Jesus Christ to suffer, don't you realize that in your suffering, he's got to process something he's doing for you and boy, he's going to bring you out of that thing so much better off. But in your suffering, you have an opportunity to fellowship with Jesus Christ and get to know him and the power of his death over sin. I'm going to give you this illustration and I'll be done with this. I, I was reading a story from a, uh, some army special ops guy. He was over in, I believe it was Afghanistan or whatever. But they were traveling from one place to the next. And as they're moving through these cities, they were coming under heavy attack everywhere they went. I mean, they were getting just hammered. And they, they were, so, he said they were so edgy. They were just, every move that was made, they were just on high alert. And they, they started coming. They saw another city ways off. They have all kinds of surveillance going on and everything else. And this city was scaring them because the city seemed super, super, super peaceful. From what they could tell, there was no enemy combatants there and whatnot. So as they got closer to the city, there, it was beautiful. It was a, a beautiful city in a, surrounded by a bunch of cities that are just, just nasty. Just a bunch of violence. They're all dirt, sand, no, no, no uh, fruit, vegetation, none of that. But they said that the way these gardens were built and all that stuff in this city, they could tell with all the vegetation in the middle of nowhere that this was centuries and centuries of old school farming techniques that had been passed down. And this place was lush with vegetation and great fruits. And as they started coming closer to that city, they're not, they're not getting any, any alerts. So it made him even more freaked out. It was like an eerie feeling. He said, before they entered into the city, they come over a hill and there was an old tree there that was still alive. But it looked, he said, it looked wicked. It just had turned black. And hanging off that tree was a body. And, and it, was, it had been there so long, some of the skin had dropped off like gelatins laying on the ground beneath him, a rotting black corpse hanging off a tree. And he said the tree was even a black color. And it just freaked all the, all the, all the special forces guys, the best of the best, just freaked them out. And as they headed toward the city, the folks started coming out and they kind of got out of the Humvees and whatnot and they're, just, they're all watching each other and they're all looking around and they're all waiting for it to drop, right? And he said, a little boy walked up and just grabbed his hand. And he said, when that kid just touched his hand, he said he just started falling apart. It was just the first, first human contact he'd come into that was peaceful. He said he didn't know what happened, but he just started bawling, just all this bottled up stuff coming out. 
and the women and children were coming out and there was young men fighting age coming out and all the rest of that and they're all waiting and the old man of the village came up and said, you're fine, you're, you're safe and you're welcome here, we're happy to have you. And he said, that old man, he looked at his eyes and he said, that old man was fierce. I knew he was fierce, but he was gentle. And everybody was happy and everybody was fruitful. And I said, you're sure I'm safe? He said, we're sure you're safe. While you're here, you'll be fine. We need to get you guys fed and washed up. And he said, that old man was looking at me. He could tell I was a young man and he could see the stress on me. And I didn't understand even what was happening to me. The tears were just coming. But it was a peaceful place. And I said, there's no Taliban. And his response was, I said, I, he said, I said to him, well, what's the deal with the body up there in the tree? He said, oh, yeah, I guess we do have one. You get the point? If you want the peace and the fruitfulness, you got to crucify the flesh. you got to have a tree outside the city that you hang it on. It's called the cross of Christ. you got to mortify the deeds of the body. And if you're willing to do that, you'll reap the rewards. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you so much, Lord, for giving us the tools that we need as Christians to live in victory over this stuff we're trapped in. And God, we recognize we got nothing to offer. We recognize we can't do it without you. We thank you for giving us your spirit, and we ask you to help us to understand how to put these things into effect in our lives. That we can have a good year this year. We can live a victorious Christian life and grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that this place, this church family, would be one of those peaceful places and that we'd be willing to crucify anything that gets in the way of the peace of God that's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. We pray for those in our assembly, Lord, and our friends who are suffering. We ask you to help them and give them the strength they need to get through their sufferings. And we do ask you, please, to give them healing. We know only you can do it. God, we can't lay our hands on them and do it. We can't speak over them and do it. There's, we, we're powerless. But you're God and you can. So we pray for you to heal them, Father. We pray that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.